At 1.30 p.m. on December 16th in 1960, Howard Dully's life changed forever. He was wheeled into an operating room in a hospital gown that gaped open at the back and was given a series of electric shocks in preparation for his lobotomy. Howard was only 11, at 62 inches tall, and weighed only 91 pounds. When Howard was 5, his mother had died of cancer, and his father married a cold and demanding woman who was borderline afraid of him because of his physical attributes and temperament. He was an unruly and belligerent boy who sometimes stole from his father and stepmother, but unsurprisingly, he did nothing out of the ordinary. He was just an average boy who had to watch his mother die at such a tender age, and who lived with adults that beat him for the slightest provocation, forced him to eat his meals alone, and were convinced that he had a mental problem. Howard woke up the morning after his lobotomy with a searing pain in his head, swollen eyes, and a high fever, but he made a full recovery. He would go on to have a good job, a wife, and children. It would not have any signs of a person who had undergone one of the most brutal surgeries in science. But Howard was lucky. Hundreds of other lobotomy patients were not. But why was the process so destructive? What made it so dangerous and hated in the medical community? Why did Freeman believe so much in the procedure despite all the bad press that it was getting? What would be the end of the lobotomy saga? After the First World War, the world, especially America, entered the Roaring Twenties, that is, the period between 1920 and 1929. America during the Roaring Twenties was a hub of great political and social revolution, but for many, it was a period of confusion, pain, and isolation. The mental and psychological effects of the war confined thousands of people to state-run mental institutions that were understaffed and underfunded. Arriving at St. Elizabeth's Hospital for the Mentally Ill in 1924, 28-year-old Dr. Walter J. Freeman was appalled. He saw over 5,000 people condemned to the haunting walls of the hospital with nothing for company except the moans and screams of the other patients. Many of them had dementia, depression, and psychosis. The doctors did not know how to treat them and did not even fully understand the nature of their illnesses. The way Freeman saw it, they did not have a life, and many of them may never have a normal place in society. It was more than Dr. Freeman could bear. So what did he do to solve the problem? Freeman was born on November 14, 1895, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. From a young age, he felt compelled to be great and change the world. He had many people around him to draw inspiration from. His maternal grandfather, William Keene, was a famous Civil War surgeon who was the first to remove a brain tumor successfully. His father also had a successful career as a doctor. While studying neurology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, Freeman came across William Spiller's groundbreaking work in the field of neurological sciences. He idolized Spiller and applied to work alongside him, but was rejected. However, the rejection did not stop him from carving a path for himself in the field of neurology, and he would later become the first neurologist in Washington after he completed his studies. But would his practice have turned out differently if he had not been rejected? In November of 1935, a Portuguese neurologist and physician, Igas Moniz, performed a psychosurgery procedure on a patient called Lucitomy. The procedure involved taking small corings, basically cutting out small pieces, of a patient's frontal lobes to treat mental illness. Freeman was fascinated by it. He idolized Moniz and became his mentee. Before long, Freeman perfected his version of the lucitomy and called it lobotomy. What was this miracle process that Freeman had developed? Freeman's lobotomy was based on several assumptions. First, the idea was that the human brain was divided into two parts, which had to be severed from each other. The first part is the frontal lobes, which control things like higher reasoning and planning. The second part is the prefrontal cortex, which is in charge of processing emotions. So why did Freeman believe these two parts had to be separated? He assumed incorrectly that in mentally ill patients, the emotional part of the brain was getting too excited and it was overwhelming the other part, making the patients behave abnormally. 
by separating the connections between the two parts, the patients would be less emotional and more subdued. Why and how did Freeman come to this conclusion? Even Freeman could not answer that question. Because Freeman was not a certified neurosurgeon, he could not do the operations by himself. He enlisted the help of James Watts, a neurosurgeon. On September 14, 1936, the pair conducted their first prefrontal lobotomy. In four years, Freeman and Watts had performed over 200 lobotomies. They published results statistics that claimed that 63% of their patients improved, 23% were unchanged, and 14% were worse. Why did they continue the surgeries knowing the number of risks involved? Why did they not stop to conduct more research into the subject? About 10 years after his first lobotomy, Freeman upgraded his technique to the transorbital lobotomy. Was the transorbital lobotomy a safer alternative? No, it was not. It was simply faster, as it could be done in under 10 minutes, in an office, without a neurosurgeon. The transorbital lobotomy, later known as the ice pick lobotomy, involved inserting a metal pick into the patient's tear duct and swishing it back and forth to sever the connections between the frontal lobes and the prefrontal cortex. Freeman became obsessed with this procedure. He sometimes did it without washing his hands while the patients were awake and could feel the pain of having an ice pick moving around in their heads. He often did up to 20 transorbital lobotomies in a day. He was also very particular about recording the procedure. Once, he left a metal pick in a patient's brain in the middle of the procedure to take pictures. The instrument slid too deep into the patient's head and killed him. Hundreds of other patients died on the operating table. Some of them became utterly unemotional and unaware of their surroundings. They would sit for hours, staring into space, drooling, unable to perform even the simplest tasks. Some of them got worse than before, more depressed, more anxious, or angrier. On many occasions, a patient would have to come back for another lobotomy. Watts eventually became fed up with Freeman's practices and left the partnership. But it was not all bad. The majority of patients who went through lobotomy became well. They became happier, lighter, and more enthusiastic about life. Often, they returned to their normal lives after being cured of ailments ranging from schizophrenia, clinical depression, and personality disorders to postpartum depression and anxiety. Freeman was never discouraged. Lobotomy gets them home, he would chant, as he moved across over 55 hospitals in 23 states, teaching hospital staff how to perform lobotomies on their patients. He believed that when there were few treatment options available to mental health patients, lobotomy was a knight in shining armor that could restore the mentally ill to their normal place in society. Many of his colleagues strongly disagreed with his lobotomies, but Freeman enjoyed the attention and loved making them uncomfortable. He would sometimes perform the lobotomies with two hands operating on both sides of the patient's head. Why did Freeman believe so much in his process? Why did he never get sued for medical malpractice? He did get banned from performing them in hospitals much later, and the medical society ostracized him. But why did he not get sanctioned more heavily? While all this was going on, Freeman lost his son, Keen, to an accident at a river. He never talked much about the situation, but could Freeman have been depressed about losing his child? Did he ever consider getting a lobotomy himself? Among Freeman's transorbital lobotomy patients was the first daughter and third child of Joseph P. Kennedy, Rosemary. Kennedy was a prominent businessman and investor. He dabbled into politics, eventually becoming the U.S. ambassador to the U.K. His son, John F. Kennedy, would later become the 35th president of the United States. Rosemary was born on September 13, 1918, at the height of the Spanish flu epidemic. The epidemic was so devastating that it wiped out 20 to 50 million people worldwide. When Rosemary's mother, Elizabeth, went into labor, there was no doctor on ground to attend to her because all the doctors were busy treating Spanish flu patients. So the presiding nurse advised Elizabeth to try and delay the birth by pressing her legs together. She even pushed the baby's head back inside when she started to slip out. Because of this, the baby was oxygen-deprived for hours. 
When a doctor finally came and delivered her, Rosemary appeared to be a normal baby. But as she grew, her parents soon discovered something not quite right about her. She was slow to crawl, walk, and talk. Her younger siblings developed at a much faster rate than her. The Kennedys were a very ambitious family that did not like the idea that their daughter had any disability. Desperate to solve their daughter's slowness, they consulted several specialists. Soon, they learned that her condition was caused by the oxygen deprivation she suffered at birth. This period was also the time when the eugenics movement was blooming. The movement, championed by Charles Darwin, was based on the belief that certain people and social groups were undesirable to the human race and should not be allowed to procreate. So, to avoid rejection from society, Rosemary's parents shipped her off to boarding schools to hide her condition. But they also tried to engage Rosemary in family activities, hoping that by holding her to the same standards as they did her siblings, she would overcome her condition and be the perfect Kennedy that they wanted her to be. But she never improved. So, Joseph secretly arranged for Rosemary to undergo a lobotomy. He did not inform his wife or any other person. Even Rosemary did not know what she was about to face when she got to Freeman's office. Rosemary was awake through the excruciating surgery. Freeman asked her to sing songs and recite prayers as he probed around her head with his ice pick. It was going according to plan until suddenly, Rosemary stopped. It appeared that something had gone wrong, but they completed the procedure. Rosemary entered the operating room as a vibrant and lovely 23-year-old woman with a manageable developmental problem. She came out as an adult with the mental capabilities of a two-year-old. She could not walk, she struggled to speak, and she could not feed herself or perform many of the simple tasks that she used to do. Joseph, horrified that her situation had gotten so bad, sent her to a psychiatric hospital in upstate New York. The family tried to maintain the illusion that all was well. They told the public that she was away studying to become a teacher or social worker. Joseph never visited her, and it took two decades before the rest of the family would visit her and find out about the lobotomy. After Joseph died in 1969, the family brought Rosemary home. Although she never regained her ability to talk, she eventually learned how to walk and enjoyed spending time with her siblings, nephews, and nieces. Rosemary died of natural causes in 2005 at the age of 86. Freeman performed his last lobotomy in February 1967 in Berkeley. His patient was a woman named Helen Mortensen, who had been one of his first lobotomy patients in 1946. She suffered a relapse of her old symptoms in 1956, and Freeman performed another lobotomy on her, only for the symptoms to return again in 1967. Freeman gave her another lobotomy, but she did not survive this time. She died a few days later from a brain hemorrhage, resulting in Freeman's license being revoked. He retired afterwards. Ultimately, Freeman conducted lobotomies on over 4,000 patients, including children and elderly people. Freeman no doubt started his lobotomy career with good intentions. But he soon got so impressed with his fame that he disregarded safety and procedure, putting thousands of lives at risk in what is today referred as one of the most barbaric medical practices in modern medicine.